take your Bibles, turn with me to Colossians chapter 1 this morning, the same passage that we heard Mark read to us uh, this morning. Mark, uh, Colossians chapter 1 this morning. Well, this is the first Sunday after Christmas, and I don't know about you, but I am always a little sad when Christmas is over. I'm one of those guys who, even though I'm an adult now, I get pretty excited about Christmas. And so when you go to my house, it looks like Christmas exploded in my house because we have Christmas trees everywhere. We have a Christmas tree in the living room, a Christmas tree in our bedroom, a Christmas tree in the kids' room, both kids' rooms, Christmas tree in the kitchen. They're everywhere. And I just, I love Christmas, and I love the decorations of Christmas. And you know, if, I, if I wasn't afraid of falling off the roof, I would have, you know, the lights hanging off the, the roof and everything. I think it just goes back to when I was a kid. Christmas is one of the best memories I have uh, from my childhood. I, I remember everything that we did together as a family. All those, all those exciting times of, of sitting around together and decorating, and, and we would string popcorn. Did you do that? String popcorn, wrap around the Christmas tree. And, and so those things hold great memories for me. And so I make it a big deal now. But now, after, after God did a work in my life when I was a kid, I came to see that Christmas is more than just decorations and all this kind of thing. I came to see what, what it was really about. You know, Christmas is over now. You know, we've spent the past four weeks focused intently on the coming of Christ. We focused everything in on realizing this truth that's displayed right here, that Christ has come. But now Christmas is over. All these weeks that we've spent focusing on Christ, things are going to go back to normal tomorrow. Go back to work. Students, you'll go back to school before too long. Christmas is over. So my question I want us to think about this morning is now what? Christ has come. Now what in our lives? You know, this major scene that we have sitting out right here is going to get put up later this week. And it won't come back again until next year. And it's almost symbolic of what happens in our lives. We spend four or five weeks focused in on the coming of Christ. Where everything that we do in church, so much of what we do at home, is focused in on remembering the incarnation. But then it seems like that week after Christmas, things go back to normal. We go back to our normal routine, our family gets back in their normal routine, and life just cruises on along. My question is, what does our life look like after Christmas? Knowing that Christ has come. There are three things that I want to do this morning. Three things that I want us to do together as a body this morning. First of all, I want us to think beyond Christmas to this week. Think beyond Christmas to this upcoming year, 2016, that we're getting ready to have. I want us to think about how the reality of the incarnation transforms everything in our lives from this point forward. Second thing is I want us to be captivated by the supremacy of Christ. For our minds to be focused in and captivated and overflowing with the reality of Christ being superior over all things. So that our gaze is constantly fixed on him. And third... I want us to think about what it means for Christ to have first place in our lives. What does it look like? What does it mean? What does it look like for Christ to have first place in everything? So that everything that we do, everything that we think, every desire that we have, all our motivation is driven by Christ as first place. 
Well, I don't think there's any better place for us to turn to consider that this morning than Colossians chapter 1. So make sure that you have your Bibles open to Colossians chapter 1, starting at verse 15 this morning. We're in one of the passages of the New Testament that gives us as much or more than any other passage in all the New Testament about the nature of Christ. This is a passage that is chock full of Christology, giving us understanding of who Christ is and what he has done. These six verses as much as anywhere in all of Scripture, overflow with the majesty and the supremacy of Christ. Now, there's more here than we could possibly cover in the next 20, 30 minutes that we have together, so we'll shorten this down and focus on just a few of the key things that are in here. But Paul here gives us a picture of Christ. And Paul takes two separate avenues as he's going through this, explaining to us the nature of who Christ is. He points to Christ as the creator and Christ as the redeemer. Mark already read this this morning, but I want you to hear it again. You heard it read once, but now I want you to hear it again. I want you just to listen. Listen and focus in on the majesty of Christ. Listen and focus in on the reality of who Christ is. And let your mind dwell and focus on him. So as you hear me reading, don't glaze over. Think about what the text is saying about Christ. Hear the word of the Lord again. He is the image of the invisible God. The firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things. In him all things hold together. He is also head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him, and through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Through him I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven. There is none greater than Christ. He is supreme over all things that he might have first place in all things. This is what we'll focus in on as we go through this passage. But I want to walk through this and just show you just some of the things that this text says. I want you to grasp the truths about Christ that are in here. And so as we go through each of these, focus your mind, focus your heart, focus your attention on each of the things that Paul says about Christ here. And let your mind be enraptured Let your heart be captivated by what the text says about who Christ is. And then we'll see in a minute how that transforms our life. He is the image of the invisible God. You remember the command in the Old Testament that you are to make no graven images. Make no images to make yourself think about what God looks like because he is invisible God. But Paul says that we now have the exact representation, the exact picture of who God is in bodily form. I mean, this is what we sing about in some of these great Christmas carols. Remember, O come, let us adore him? Remember, think about this line that's in that. Yea, Lord, we greet thee, born this happy morning. Jesus, to thee be all glory given. Word of the Father, now in flesh appearing. Now in flesh he is here. And what's the refrain that goes along with that, that chorus that comes after? Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him, Christ the Lord. Why is there that refrain that comes after? Because the response to who Christ is as word of God in flesh now appearing is worship. What else does he deserve than total worship? What about the, the, the song, Hark the Herald Angels Sing? Veiled in flesh, the Godhead see, hailed incarnate deity, pleased with us in flesh to dwell, Jesus, our Emmanuel. And then what's the chorus of that? 
Hark, the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king. All these carols that we have been singing cry out of the majesty of the one who is now made flesh. And the response to that is, come, let us adore him. Let us adore the one who is worthy of all worship because he is the exact image of who God is. This is what Paul is saying. What about where he says next there that he is the firstborn of all creation? He is the firstborn out of creation. Now, don't get confused by this. Paul isn't saying here that that Christ was created. It doesn't mean that he was some point made. But when it says firstborn, it means that he is the one who has all rights. The firstborn would be the one who has all right and all authority, right? And so he is the one who has all rights, all authority. It all belongs to him. Now, there's some groups who look at this passage and say, oh, well, that means that Jesus was created. The Son was created. Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, look at this and say that. That's absolutely not what it's saying. He has all rights, all authority. This one, born here, all rights, all authority is his as the firstborn. He's the creator of all things. He can't be created if he is the creator of all things. He's always been there. There is nothing that exists that was not created and established by Christ. The rulers and authorities that are mentioned here, created by Christ. The powers and dominions, created by Christ. There is nothing in heaven, nothing on earth, that has not come through Christ as the agent of creation. There's a book that came out just recently that talks about the star that appeared uh, over Bethlehem. You, you remember about the, the wise men following this star. Well, there's this astronomer who did some research and worked with a theologian and said, well, that star may have been this particular comet that came by and appeared and, and showed the way to, uh, to these wise men. I don't know if that's right. I don't know if it was a star. I don't know exactly what it was. Here's what I know. That star that announced the birth of Christ was created by Christ. Every atom, every molecule, everything created by Christ. And there that star is announcing the Christ has come, and he's the one who made it. There is nothing in this world that exists that Christ has not been the agent of creation for. You, sitting right here, the special creation of God through Christ. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Think about these things. Think about the majesty of what Paul is saying here. He is before all things. As the one who is self-existent, this baby who was born 2,000 years ago is the one who has always existed. The son has always been there. He holds all things together by the power of his hand. Everything's created by through him, and everything holds together by him. This means that if Christ did not continue this upholding hand in creation, it's it's not just that things would fly apart and be crazy. It's that it just wouldn't be. The fact that you and I are sitting here in this building at this moment is that Christ is continuing to uphold the existence of this world, all upheld by his hand so Paul now telling us about the power and the majesty of Christ in creation switches gears he shifts and start talking about the power and the majesty and the might of Christ as the redeemer look back at the text again look back at what it says starting uh, in about verse 18 it says he's the the head of the body the church the church is his Because he bought it. The church is his. It belongs to him. That means me and you in here right now belong to Christ. Grace Baptist Church, not ours, but Christ. The universal church, all believers, all the time, belongs to Christ. It is all his because he bought all of it by his death on the cross. He's the firstborn from the dead. He is the one who rose from the dead, who conquered death. Death, where is your sting? Death, where is your sting? It is gone. You know, for each and every one of us in here, we will die unless Christ comes back. There will be a moment where I breathe my last breath. 
and this body will cease to work. But death has no sting for me because of what Christ has done. He is risen from the grave, and so I will also rise from the grave one day. That grave will not hold me. Whether it's a hundred years from now or a thousand years from now or whenever Christ comes back, that grave will not be mine. I will rise again one day. And that is the hope, the glory that each of us have if we are in Christ because he is the firstborn from the dead. He is the fullness of God. We don't see when we look at Christ just a good teacher. We don't see someone who is just a good man. We see the one who is God himself before us. Baby born, God incarnate, raised up to be this man who is also God himself, fullness of God. And this man reconciled all things to himself. Think about that. Dead in sin. At enmity with God. Separated from God. Having no hope in the world. Nothing that we could do to make ourselves right with God. But Christ reconciled us to himself by the blood of his cross. Let us think about that, brothers and sisters. Let us think about the majesty of Christ and what he has done, that he has now made peace through his blood, his death on the cross, being separated from God, being made right with God now, the fullness of the wrath of God poured out on Christ rather than on us. I want you to think of these things. Just, just let your mind dwell on what Paul says here. He is the image of the invisible God. He's the firstborn of all creation. He's the creator of all things. He is before all things. He holds all things together. He is the head of the church. He is the firstborn from the dead. He is the fullness of God. He, is, he reconciled all things to himself. He has made peace through his blood. All of these majestic statements of who Christ is, what Christ has done, and then at the center of this passage, it tells us reasons why. Look at verse 16. It says that verse, in verse 16, it says that all things have been created through him and for him. Verse 18 says that he might have first place in everything. So all these things that we see here in verses 15 through 20, all these statements about who Christ is, what Christ has done in creation and as Redeemer, it says that it is all for him that he might have first place in everything. It is all for him that he might be first in everything. And this is what we see written all throughout the New Testament. Philippians chapter 2 that I just read, that one day every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Christ is Lord because it is all for him, because he alone is Lord. Hebrews chapter 1, he has sat down at the right hand of the majesty. He has inherited a name that is better than the angels because he alone is Lord. So here's how this comes together. Christ is supreme over all things. One day, all of creation will recognize his supremacy over all things. One day in heaven, you and I who are believers will perfectly bow down and worship him as Lord over all things. But right now, we do that very imperfectly. Christ is to have first place in all things. But I think the reality is, is that when you and I look at our lives, we can honestly say that is, that takes place imperfectly, of Christ having first place in all things. And that's where we come to when we're saying that Christmas is over, now what? We, we've spent all this time dwelling on the reality of Christ's coming. We've spent all this time thinking about the incarnation. Well, Christmas is over. We go back to our normal routines. 
And usually what happens is that in the busyness of life, everything going on, other things pretty quickly creep in to take first place. What does it mean practically for my life and for your life to say that Christ has come? What does it mean for us to believe this and to believe what it says in Colossians 1 and say, yes, Christ is to have first place in everything. The answer is simple. We know what it means. We know Christ is to be first in everything. But it's not always the way it looks in our day-to-day lives. Let's go back to the text. Go back to the text for just a minute. Let's think about what is this going to look like in my life and your life. All right, the text there says, that he is to have first place in all things. So let's think just about the idea of all things for just a second. What does it mean, all things? And so if I think about for just a second, I think about in my mind all things in my life. The first things that come to my mind are the things that take up the most attention in my life. Now other than God, the, there are three things that really take up the most attention in my life. It's my family, my ministry, and the schoolwork that I do. Those are the things that really take up the the most attention in my life. So if I ask you, what comes to your mind when you say all things in your life? There's probably some key things that are come up in your mind that really take up a lot of your focus, a lot of your attention in your life. When it says all things here, it means all things. All things that are in our lives. The intangibles that are in our lives, like the the motivations we have, the motivations that we have for for doing our job, the motivations that we have in our family, motivations we have with our kids, motivations for your sports, motivations for school students, motivations for your hobbies that you have, motivations for your business, motivation for you as an employer or employee. All these things fall under that category of all things. Well, what about all things including desires, the desires that we have that we represent our deepest longings. The desires that we have for our job, the desires that we have for our marriage, the desires that you have for your future, desires that you have for your kids, the desires that you have for your spouse, the desires that you have just in your normal, everyday routine that you go through. All things includes all things. All things includes the role that you play. We have some in here are single, we have some here are married. We have husbands, we have wives, we have parents, we have children. We have children, that's not a word, children. Each of you have a different role that you play in here. All things includes our stage of life. I'm 35 years old, and so Pastor Bill has really gotten excited since I've turned 35 because he says in Psalm 90, it says the age of a man's life is 70 to 80 years. And so he says, oh, you're halfway there. So thanks, Pastor Bill. So, I'm, okay, let's say I'm halfway there, 35 years old, and so I've gone through some different stages of life. I've been that point where I was a kid under my parents' authority. I've been that point where I became a believer as a kid under my parents' authority. I've gone through that stage of life where I was a teenager and the the challenges and the joys that come with that. I've gone through the stage of life where I was a college student. I've gone through the stage of life where I was a single adult. I've gone through the stage of life where where I got married. Gone through the stage of life of being married with no kids, stage of life married with kids, And then there are different stages that are coming further on down my life if God allows. There are stages of empty nest, stages of retirement, stages of old age. Paul says all things. It means all things. It says that Christ has come that he might have first place in all things. And all things means all things. I don't know about you, what do you think about when you think of first place? When I think about the concept of something being first place, I think about sports. My mind immediately goes to sports and having first place in something. Now, to be honest, the past 10 or 15 years, sports haven't played a whole big role in my life. But when I was a kid, there was nothing I enjoyed more than sports. I loved playing basketball. 
I loved playing baseball, but my favorite was football. I loved little league football. And I can still remember playing for the Cowboys in little league football. And I, can, I still have on my Christmas tree, because Christmas explodes at my house, I still have on my Christmas tree a Dallas Cowboys ornament because I played for the Cowboys in Little League football. And we were number one in the state. State champion Little League football team is what we were. Two years in a row. Those are my glory days of football in Little League. I, it didn't extend past that. Now, no matter what our score was, even if we came in first place, there was always a second place, right? It doesn't matter how dominant a team is, there's always a second place. But when it says that Christ came, that he might have first place in all things, it doesn't mean that Christ came that he might be first and then a close second means that Christ came that he might be first and there is no real second. That there is nothing even that comes close to competing because Christ is so much first in all things. You know, we can think about this in concept of, of marriage relationship. In a marriage relationship, does it work that, that the spouse has, you know, the, the wife who is first place and then there's another woman who, she's close second. Is that the way marriage works? It, no, it shouldn't. How's marriage supposed to work? That you have a relationship with your spouse in which that spouse is first place, and there is no second. The relationship with your spouse determines every other relationship that you have. That's what Paul is saying. Christ came that he might have first place in all things. So that there really is no second place. That he is so first in everything that nothing else compares. That he is so first place in everything, all things in your life, that there is nothing even that is remotely close to the role, the place that Christ has in our lives. That brings us to a question. How does that happen in our lives? How does Christ become more and more first place in everything in your life? Because I think if you're honest, if you're like me, you look at your life and you see there are some things that Christ is not first place in. And there are times where Christ is first place in your marriage and Christ may not be quite first. You may look at something in your life and say, yeah, Christ is, Christ is first in this, but there are some other things. Christ isn't taking first place in those things. How does Christ move? from where he is in your life to becoming more and more first place in all things. I think it's by what we see here. By remembering and focusing on and believing the nature of who Christ is. Let, let me show you how thing Christ becomes less than first in our lives. You know, after Christmas, we go about our normal routine and the busyness of life picks up. Students, you go back to school. College students, you have a little bit longer, then you go back to school. Your work picks back up. Everything busy starts to become more and more busy. And here's what happens. In our lives, we've spent a long time this past few weeks focusing in on Christ. As we get back into the routine of the busyness of our lives, we start focusing on those things in our lives. Your eyes become really focused on your job. Your eyes become really focused on your family. Your eyes become really focused on whatever it is that you have going on. And Christ moves from this first place that dominates everything down, down, down more and more based on where your gaze goes. And so for our gaze to make Christ more and more and more and more first place in all things has to be fixed on him. So if you're looking at your life right now and you see some areas that Christ is pointing out to you that you can look at and say, yeah, there are some areas that Christ is not first place, where he's not the driving motivation, where he's not my first love. The way that's changed 
is by setting your gaze fully on what's said here. See, the more that your gaze is captivated and filled with Christ alone, then Christ alone bleeds into everything in your life. The more that you are gazing on him and focused on him as first place in your vision and what you're thinking and what you're desiring and what you're wanting, then that means that he starts to become naturally first place in everything else because he is filling all of your vision. And so you start thinking about him as the one who is the image of the invisible God. You set your focus on him as the firstborn of all creation, the one who created all things, whether heavens and on earth. He is the firstborn, that he is the head of the body, that he himself will have first place in everything, that is the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him. You think upon these things, you dwell on these things, and as that fills your gaze, he fills more of your life as the first place. So what is it this morning, what is it this week, what is it in 2016 where Christ is not first place? There is nothing in your life over which Christ does not say, that is mine. You know, over the past, uh, about two weeks ago, we had this Christmas musical where the kids did. It's called Christmas in Reverse. And this musical started out with everybody gathered around the manger. It started out where most musicals end. And the reason it was for that was because the musical was showing how everything actually started. It took us all the way back to the Garden of Eden and that first sin. And now all the way from the beginning, it was God's plan to send a Savior. And it moved us through Adam and Eve to Noah and the prophets and all the way to this manger scene of Christ having come. Well, Christ has come. Christmas has come. And so I ask you the question, now what? What is it going to look like for your life for Christ to have first place in all things? What is that thing that Christ is pointing out right now where he's not first? And what's it going to look like for him to become first of that thing? Let's pray together. Our Father, we come before you with great thanksgiving that Christ has come. Savior born in the flesh. Word of the Father now appearing. O come, let us adore him. O come, let us adore him. O come, let us adore him, Christ the Lord. God, we remember that you are worthy of of all worship. And there is nothing in our lives over which you do not declare it is yours. And so, Father, I pray that in this time you will pierce our hearts by your Spirit to show us those areas of our lives that we have clung to for ourselves and have not submitted to you as Lord over all. God, I pray for conviction in our lives. I pray for transformation in our lives. And I pray, God, that we will be captivated by what we have seen about Christ this morning. That he might have first place in all things. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.